Good day, elders, family, friends, leaders, young people, two-spirit and non-binary folks. My name is Tithkanit, and I'm from the Silch and Sihuatm nations. My name, Tithkanit, was given to me on the day that I was born. Uh, it means standing by water. It was given to me by my tama, Elaine Alec. My English name is Elaine Alec. My late father is from, uh, my late father's name is Saul Kenzie Basil from the Bonaparte Indian Band. He was chief for the Bonaparte Indian Band for a number of years in the 70s. He was also part of the American Indian Movement um, back in the 70s and was responsible for the shutdown of the Department of Indian Affairs offices in Vernon, BC in 1974. He is the son of Saul and Louisa Basil and hereditary leadership from the Sihuatl Nations in British Columbia. My late mother is Sophie Alec from the Penticton Indian Band. She is the daughter of the late Chief Jack Alec, uh, who was the first elected chief for our community. Uh, he was chosen by the matriarchs in our community to be our first elected chief because he was married to my Tama, uh, who is also a descendant of hereditary leadership. Um, my Tama's name was Philemon Francois, who was the daughter of Chief Francois, who is also known as Surimt, um, who is the son of Kuthbuk Jenten, who uh, are descendants of Pelkamulah. Pelkamulah was a hereditary chief from the interior of Washington state and had 24 wives um, from Washington into British Columbia, from the Rocky Mountains to the ocean. I share my introduction in that way for a number of reasons. One, because my elders told me to. <laughs> Two, because there was a time when my parents and grandparents could not speak our language without being punished. So I speak my language in every public forum that I can. The other reason I do that is because I was told that when I say the names of my ancestors out loud, it calls them into the space with me. So if I'm ever scared or if I'm ever intimidated, I say their names out loud and it calls them into the space with me. And so it allows me to be in this space and um, be who I am and be proud of who I am. Because for so many years of my life, I was very ashamed to be Indigenous. Um, my first day of school in grade, when I was five years old, um, I was tripped on the way into class. And the kids called me ugly, they called me dirty, they called me squaw, they called me wagon burner. And I heard that every day of my life growing up, and I was five. And this was happening by other five-year-old kids. And I never knew what they meant, but I knew that it was bad. And so when you hear those things every day, you begin to believe it. You're ugly, you're dirty, you're, you're stupid. Um, but I think one of the things that helped keep me alive, and I know it was the thing that kept me alive, was the love of my tama. Because I grew up for the first six years of my life with my grandmother, my tama, and every night she would rub my back. And every night she would rub my back and she'd speak in the language and she'd tell me coyote stories. And I didn't know that those coyote stories were our laws. I didn't know that those coyote stories taught me how to be a good individual, a good part of the family, a good part of the community, and a good part of the nation, but more importantly, how to have a reciprocal relationship with the land, um, and knowing that whatever I take, I must give back, and that there are protocols in place for me to do those things. Um, it, but it also helps give me a strong identity and a strong sense of belonging and a rootedness to the land that I come from. Um, and so whenever I come into a new territory, one of the things I was sharing with my sister is that I can never go into anybody else's territory without acknowledging the ancestors. And even being in this building is hard for me because I know what was taken from our people to have this space here. And so remembering one of the things that was shared with me was that the state of the land is a reflection of the state of the people. And the state of the people is a reflection of the state of the land. And so when we see things like the climate crisis happening across the world, it's a reflection of our people and the healing that's needed. And so last night, Ashley said something when people were talking about going to other countries and helping and being prepared. 
And one of the things she shared was like her own work she needed to do first and foremost. Um, and that's a lot of what our teachings say, is that we can't fix anybody else. We can't heal anybody else. We can't help anybody else. But so many times we become helpers because we, we want to fix things, because we don't want to deal with our own stuff. And so we're constantly focusing on everybody else and all of our families and communities and saving the planet. But we don't want to do that internal work on ourselves because it sucks. It's hard. Like, it's not fun at all. I talked about falling in love with my husband in my book. And I was like, it sucked. <laughs> I did not enjoy. People talk about falling in love and how nice it is. But when you grow up hearing these things in your head and believing you're stupid and ugly and everybody's going to leave you because you have abandonment issues, um, you constantly, you have to break through that to accept the love into your life. And that's been the biggest thing for me, especially as an Indigenous woman in the work that I do, how hard it was for me to accept love and praise from people when they were giving it to me, you know, when they wanted to talk to me and feeling worthy and deserving of that love and feeling worthy and deserving to be in the same space as, as people that I grew up telling me I didn't belong. You know, all of the people that told me, that, like, you don't belong here. What are you doing here? And so those things go through my, my brain all the time whenever I'm, I'm reclaiming space. But the thing that I learned is that breaking colonialism is that as I reclaim space as an Indigenous woman, I'm showing that we can reclaim space without pushing anybody else out. That even, you know, when we talk about feminist movements, it's about women reclaiming space, but reclaiming space without pushing the men out because exclusion and shame is upholding colonial practices. And so doubling down on what inclusion means in that we need everybody in this space um, if we truly want to heal. Um, and that's hard, especially for people who've been oppressed, you know. I've spent many years being angry. You know, I had my first drink when I was 12 years old and I jumped on the highway of tears and I hitchhiked across, you know, the, the country and, you know, I did a lot of things because I believed all of those things about myself. And so I started drinking at the age of 12. And, and part of the story about my book, Calling My Spirit Back, is that our people say that alcohol has a spirit. And we're born with a spirit. The moment we come into this world, even before we come into this world, we're light and we can see everything. And so we pick our path and we pick everything that happens to us because we know those things are gonna lead us to who we need to be. And it was so hard for me to accept when I was younger because I was like, I would not have picked this life. <laughs> I would not have picked all these things to happen to me. But every single thing that happened to me in my life, as brutal and as hard and traumatic as it was, made me who I am. And it's made me feel compassion and love for everybody that I've ever come across now. I've heard those stories. And every time I try to judge somebody, I get humbled every time. You know, I've learned through my years now that it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, how much money you have, how little money you have, that we all have the same stories and spirits and, and that we all have that necessary requirement for love and compassion. And so, you know, a lot of my work that has been done has been loving myself and having compassion for myself and forgiving myself and, you know, being easy on myself when things start going bad in my life. And so a lot of that was about the teachings around calling my spirit back is when your spirit comes into you when you're born, you have to take care of that spirit and that spirit lives in your belly button. And so that spirit is also your instinct. And so our people grow up, you know, we grow up with our elders saying like that every time you get that feeling in your gut, that feeling, a lot of people mistake it as fear. And so they don't say anything. But what our people say is when you feel that fear that in your hands get sweaty, that's your spirit telling you that you have to stand up and speak out. You have to stand up and whatever's coming um, up, you have to stand up and speak out. So every time um, you drink alcohol, our people say, is the alcohol spirit drives out your spirit. And the alcohol spirit replaces your spirit. And that alcohol spirit stays with you for four days and four nights. 
And that's why afterwards you feel hungover and you feel sick and you feel empty because your spirit's gone and it's replaced by the alcohol spirit. And so I never went more than four days without drinking, you know, for the longest time. And every time I would start to, you know, get my spirit back, I'd get anxiety, I'd get afraid because I didn't know how to process feelings and emotions because growing up being abused and, you know, being abused in so many ways, I learned to not feel. That was my survival mechanism, was to not feel the feelings. And so I numbed them out. And a lot of it was through drinking. And I've done every, every addiction there is, you know, there, everything that's, that's there that I've, I've done to numb the feelings. And so every time my spirit would come back, I'd numb it again and I'd quiet, I'd quiet it. And to forget things. Um, but one of the things I realized is you don't get to choose what you block out. So if you're blocking and putting up walls to keep the pain out, to keep the sadness out, you're also keeping the love out and the happiness out and the joy out. And when we don't feel love, happiness, and joy, we blame it on others. You don't make me feel loved. If you loved me, you would do this, and then I would feel loved. Um, but a lot of it comes from that inside. Like if I'm protecting myself from being hurt, I'm also protecting myself from love. And so that sucks. That's why I said falling in love was so hard because I had to be vulnerable and I had to be soft when I'd spent so many years of my life being hard and angry. So many times, you know, drinking and getting in fights and ending up in the back of cop cars and doing all these things that harmed myself. And so as I started to stay sober, I started to remember things, and I didn't want to remember things. I didn't want to remember all those things that happened to me when I was a little girl and all the things that happened to me as I got older. But what I also started to remember was my language, and I started to remember my stories, and I started to remember those things that my tama told me every night, rubbing my back. And one of the things that she would get me to do was go to the water. Go to the water and just be there. Go to the water and, and introduce yourself to the land. And I remember being young and looking for advice. Every time I had a struggle, my, my elders would say, go to the water. And so I'd go to the water and I'd wait. <laughs> waiting for the creator to give me a sign, waiting for the water to talk to me, waiting to hear some message come from somewhere. And then, you know, sitting there getting really, you know, really worked up trying to figure out what it was that I was supposed to get from the water. And I didn't get it for the longest time. But then later on, as I started to learn about the brain and how it works when you're traumatized, when you move to the lower part of your brain, you can't focus, you can't concentrate, you can't, you know, be positive, you're stuck. You feel so stuck when you're in that trauma brain or that lower part of your brain. And the only way to get yourself out of that brain is to cultivate a sense of safety. And our people say water is life, water is healing, and the sound of water is just as important as water itself. And so as I got older and I would go to the water and I'd sit there, I'd start to feel safe. And I'd start to feel good. And I would sit there and I'd just listen to the water and as I'm listening to the water, the answer would come to me. And that was one of the things that I learned from my elders is that we all have the answers. We're born with everything we need to know. Colonization has taught us to like look at the experts. You know, everybody else has the answer but us. Um, but our elders raised us to believe you have everything you need inside of you. Every time you struggle, every time you're lost, go to the water. Um, and that's, I was 44 years old when I found out what my, why my grandmother named me Standing by Water. All of my teachings come from the water. And every time we're named in my family after our hereditary chiefs, we carry our ancestors through our name. And so all of these teachings are from my ancestors, from generations and generations and generations. This knowledge has been passed down to our people through those bedtime stories. They're not legends, they're not myths, they're who we are, and they guide us in how we're supposed to be in this world. And my people, um, we come from the seal people, um, and we're called coyotes people. 
and Coyote's people has the responsibility to teach. And that we're told that we came here as siblings from the four directions, from all over the world. And that one day that we would come back together again and it would be our responsibility to teach our siblings what we learned when we were in those different lands, to remember that we were siblings and that we could get through the darkness because the prophecies say that if we don't listen to each other, we're going to live in 100 years of darkness. And so we've lived that and we're coming out of that. And the only way for us to move out of that is to listen. Listen with discipline to what everybody shares. Um, our stories tell us about listening to fly, the bug, the seemingly most insignificant being, the annoying one that nobody wants around, that we have to listen to fly. We have to listen with discipline. Listen to every person that talks to you without judging what they're saying as right or wrong, good or bad. Even the person you don't like, even the person that's annoying, listen to them. Um, because their voice is important for some reason, and we don't even have to give an answer to that reason, why, why we need to listen to those voices. But all of these teachings are the things that I remembered when I got sober. And October 10th uh, was my 14 years of sobriety. <laughs> And the first two years really sucked. Because <laughs> I did not know how to feel the feelings. I did not know how to trust my body. I did not know how to trust my heart and my feelings and, and everything that was going on inside of me. But all of those teachings were teaching us to feel the fear, face the fear, and do it anyway. From the moment we're four years old, we're told, go out into the dark. And when you feel that shiver down your back, that fear of, you know, <laughs> that our elders told us stay there. When you feel that feeling, stay there because that's your spirit helper coming to you. And so from the age of four, we were being taught to feel the fear and stay there so that you could step forward and continue to do the work and go to the water when you're struggling. That everything that you ever need to know in this world, you're born with it. You have the answers to trust your body, to trust the way it feels, because colonialism has made it all about the head. You know, we have to overthink things, emotions are no good, you have to keep those things in, but our people say it's the heart. It's the heart and it's the gut, it's that instinct that reminds us who we are and what, I, what we need to do when that instinct kicks in and we don't feel like this is good for us, it's not good for us. No matter what people are telling you, you know, oh, this is fine, but you know inside it's not. And so I just want to take this time to thank each and every one of you uh, for sharing this space. I'm very thankful to Don and Taryn, you know, over the years. The last two years during the pandemic was really tough. Um, and the releasing my book was so tough. And... Um, the convoy stuff was so tough with racism and all of the violence that was happening and all of the things that were happening up against indigenous peoples and the violence that we were experiencing where we felt so alone, like felt so very alone and unseen within our own territories, which is why I wear what I wear in public spaces when I speak because I no longer want to be invisible within my own lands. <sighs> So, so uh, yeah, I've, I've adopted Dawn and Taryn as my family and just so grateful for introducing me to the She Recovers community um, and for really helping raise the voices of people who've been marginalized in, um, for so many years. So, white, thank you. Thank you.